Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome. Hello, my name is uh, Tim Lorden. I am the executive director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, and we are hosting this event in conjunction with the Congressional Internet Caucus and its co-chairs. Um, the Congressional Internet Caucus was founded about 21 years ago um, in 1996. Um, and in a lot of ways, the history of the Congressional Internet Caucus was created in the wake of the topic that we're going to be talking about today, in the wake of the, the, the Communications Act, uh, the Telecom Act of 1996, and the Communications Decency Act, which ultimately became uh, 230. Sorry. Um, and so uh, the co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus on the House side here, um, the leaders are uh, Congressman Bob Goodlatte, and Congressman Anna Eshoo, and on the Senate side, um, Cong Senator John Thune and Senator Patrick Leahy, and there are hundreds of members of the Congressional Inter Caucus. And it's been, it's as far as inter in inter internet time, it's an ancient institution. It's been around since you know for 21 years, which really predates most things except for Section 230. So a um, little bit of housekeeping. Um, today we'll be live streaming on Facebook Live. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, awesome. And then secondly, the hashtag for the conversation today is SEC230, um, short for Section 230. So if you want to get some materials, um, we'll be posting the video and audio after the fact um, up on that hashtag so you can, you can filter that way. Um, but let me introduce our, our speakers today for the panel, which is called Carving Out Exceptions to Section 230, How Will It Affect the Internet? And to my right directly is Julie Cohn, uh, the Mamelin Professor in Law and Technology at Georgetown University Law School. We have Rachel Wolbers, who's the Policy Director at Engine, and I can have her talk, talk about what Engine is in a little bit. And then Eric Goldman, who's the Professor in Law and Co-Director of the High Tech Law Institute at Santa Clara University Law School. So um, I think... Julie, um, Julie's office is like right down the street. Um, Rachel isn't too far, but um, we really appreciate uh, Eric flying all the way in from the West Coast to, to do this for us. And, and um, these are some heavy hitters when it comes to law and, and the marketplace, so we're really grateful to have a panel like this um, with us. So let me, let me just get started. Um, and what I'm going to do is I think there's a lot of questions about this topic, so I'm going to welcome questions halfway through the conversation. We're going to be here for one hour and one hour only. Um, and um, I do welcome questions from the audience, so please you know, get them ready. Um, but let me just give you some um, you know, orientation for what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Section 230 was this kind of small amendment um, of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. At the time, I was like a telecom geek in law school, um, and I was really focused on telecom stuff, um, interlata exchange rates, long-distance voice calling, unbundled network elements, and I lived and breathed it. Um, and in that statute, the Telecom Act of 96, had, it was huge. It was basically the, the Affordable Care Act of the telecom world. It was the first major update to the telecommunications infrastructure since like the 1934, 1934 Telecom Act. It was massive. And Section 230 um, was put into it um, in two different ways. Um, on the Senate side, there was an they, w they had an amendment that was sponsored by Senator Exxon and a few others on the Senate side. And then, in con then Congressman Ron Wyden and Congressman Chris Cox introduced a, a separate amendment in the House of Representatives, which was voted on and ultimately un unanimously passed. And the reason they did this was at the, at the dawn of the internet, and if anybody can remember what the number one song of 1996 was, I would give them a, a dollar. The number one song of 1996 was the Macarena. And if you guys don't remember it, like I think Eric can like hum it and then do the dance, but maybe we don't want to do that. Um, but the Macarena, so it, it predates Google, predates Facebook. Um, the only really internet company that you can remember um, around the time was Amazon.com. Um, AT&T had just launched WorldNet, which was their dial-up ISP service for consumers. The, the internet was relatively new. And um, the, there was a concern also that um, this is a new medium and new ways to access information. And also there was a concern about the availability of sexually explicit material. Uh, Senator Exxon's amendment on the Senate side wanted to address that issue. Um, and at the same time, there was a case um, going through the courts, um, and, and maybe Julie and, and Eric can kind of talk about it in a little more detail, but it was called um, Prodigy versus Stratton Oakmont. And essentially, the idea is that the internet's different than broadcast licenses, right? So a broadcast station, I have a big broadcast antenna at the top of my street. 
um, and Channel 4 News broadcasts um, from that antenna to the entire D.C. metro area. And it's basically NBC, they get a license from the Federal Communications Commission, and they broadcast one too many, like, not too many, but one too many people. And the Internet's different, where it goes two ways. People can be a publisher, but they can also consume information. And, and the, even, at, even at that point, there was a recognition that people are uploading tremendous amounts of information, and frankly, all the content on the Internet was done by people at home uh, and, and small businesses doing this stuff. So um, there was a recognition that it was a little different. But the question of uh, Stratton, Oakmont versus Prodigy was that some user on Prodigy service, which has not survived the test of time, I don't even think Prodigy got out of the 1990s, um, it, it was that um, somebody on Prodigy, the service, had posted some you know, def defamatory uh, financial information about a firm or something. And uh, the Stroke, Stratton, Oakmont sued um, Prodigy for hosting that content as if they were the New York Times or Channel 4 News broadcasting from the top of the hill um, using their FCC license. And the courts found that Prodigy was liable for the information that was put up by one of its users, which they had no control over and didn't even know was there. And you know, the reason was that they argued in court that you know, Prodigy had tried to actually curate the content on their, on their site, and they wanted to make it you know, PG. Well, you know, parental, parental guidance or just kind of PG, not R, not X, and they just wanted to like, keep um, sexually explicit material off the site. And for, because they did that, the court said, well, if you can, you can filter for sexually explicit material and get that stuff off your site, you certainly could do defamatory information about a financial services company. $200 million was the judgment. Um, I don't think at any point in its history, Prodigy was worth $200 million. Uh, they certainly didn't have that. Um, and, and people in Congress were alarmed, especially on the Senate side, Congressman uh, Chris Cox, uh, Congressman Ron Wyden, who was a congressman at that time. And they said, well, uh, wait, maybe the best way to do this, rather than creating, uh, is to introduce this legislation that would limit the liability um, of ISPs so that they could not be held responsible for how are they going to know that this particular statement is, is defamatory, but also would allow, incentivize them to, to curate the content on their site and actually police their site um, for sexually explicit material and just you know, objectionable stuff that they don't necessarily want their users to have to deal with. So they created Section 230 as an amendment, as a substitute um, in the Telecom Act. Um, now, Senator Ron Wyden has explained that the Senate version, um, which he did not like, um, created a kind of a indecency standard. And that's the same standard that the broadcast networks and broadcasters and radio transmitters have the same thing. You don't hear seven dirty, you know, the seven dirty words argument on broadcast television, you know, Bono dropping the F-bomb, Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction. All of those things are indecent under broadcast standards. So those things are not allowed. Senator Exxon said, that's a great great thing, we should have the same standard of decency on the internet. And no one, no one under 18 should be able to see these things and you know, the whole thing. Creating kind of a potentially a um, FCC type of indecency regime that the government would have to be in the, uh, in, in the way of kind of determining what is decent and what is not. Um, and that was the Communications Decency Act. It turns out that both of those pieces of legislation um, passed in the act, even though Section 230 was meant to be a substitute to the uh, Senator Exxon Amendment, but both went through together. Um, it was immediately challenged in the courts, um, and this is a bit of history. Um, the Senator Exxon Amendment um, that created the indecency standard uh, for young people was immediately challenged in court. It, um, ACLU versus Reno ultimately struck down that, that decision and stripped away those portions uh, of the bill. But Senator uh, uh, Congressman Wyden and Congressman Cox's provision, Section 230, remained intact because there was no issue with it from a freedom of expression perspective. So uh, here we are. Um, and in subsequent years, um, Section 230 uh, does two things. It, it creates limited liability uh, for ISPs. And ISPs could be interactive computer services, and that's what they're technically called in the statute. It could be AT&T and Verizon. It could be Facebook, Google. It could be um, even Uber. It could be, and then everywhere along the stack, you could argue that um, you know, GoDaddy is an ISP to a certain extent. Um, uh, Cloudflare is, is an ISP to a certain extent. There's tons of different levels of the stack that probably Section 230 applies to. Um, I think there's a question we had a debate in my, my, in my office the other day whether the blockchain is essentially covered under Section 230. I don't know. Um, 
but it's a good question for later, and I, we have legal scholars, we can talk about this after the fact. Um, so here we are, and then as things go along, the statute gets passed in, in the Telecom Act of 96. There's virtually, I, I might have some argument here, but there's virtually nothing left that's relevant of the Telecom Act of 1996 um, when it comes to all the different provisions. Sure, there were like, really interesting things about um, re requirements for closed captioning for people with disabilities at home and things like that, but largely, you know, the, the tel telecom regulations and the, the competitive juices it was supposed to spur have, are la largely in the past. But what remains is this statute called Section 230 um, that at the dawn of the internet really potentially argued that uh, enabled a huge growth of user-generated content in the internet that we know today, while at the same time allowing ISPs to curate and community police the stuff that's on their sites. Like, for instance, I don't, I've never in my life seen anything sexually explicit on Facebook. And the reason is that Section 230 essentially allows Facebook to say, we're not going to have porn or sexually explicit material on Facebook because the community that we want to engender and foster, and they really work hard at their community, doesn't include that. And they're struggling with other types of speech, as you've probably have read in the press, you know, over the last you know, year or so. Um, but Section 230 allows them to create a terms of service and say, this is the type of community we're going to create. And there are terms of service say, this is what we want to foster. Um, and, and, and by doing so, it allows them to filter out that type of content and block that type of content or take down that type of content without incurring liability. As long as they tell you, this is, this is how we feel about it in our terms of service. So that's where we are. Um, after the amendment was passed, um, there was a major case um, that kind of tested the limits of it. And subsequently, there have been hundreds of cases, um, people saying, well, Section 230 should have exemptions for this, Section 230 should have exemptions for that, et cetera, et cetera. And I think I can ask you know, Eric and, and perhaps Julie and, and Rachel to kind of elaborate on how the, how the case law has developed. But uh, just to frame the conversation, the reason we're here today is that after 21 years um, of Congress, you, uh, passing this statute, uh, what, is, what has its effect been? Um, what, is the, what are the exceptions that people have sought over the years to it? And are those exceptions good and will they impact how the internet grows and how businesses are done on the internet and free expression on the internet? So that's, that's essentially the scope of what I wanted to talk about today. That was a long-winded explanation. I apologize for taking so much time. Um, but let me just let me just also direct your attention to um, an interesting um, article uh, by uh, Professor Daniel Keats Citron and uh, Benjamin Wittes. Uh, Professor Citron is at University of Maryland Law School. Uh, uh, Mr. Wittes is at the Brookings Institution. And they wrote this article um, called The Internet Will Not Break, Denying Bad Sam Samaritans Section 230 Im Immunity. Um, and, and in the article, they argue you know, several things that you know, the internet is no longer new. You have some of these companies are billion dollar companies. They're like the, the captains of industry, so to speak. And, and the internet doesn't need the coddled protection that uh, Congressman Wyden and Congressman Cox wanted to give it while it was in the cradle. And that's one of their arguments. Uh, they also argue that um, uh, Congress never meant to have limited liability for ISPs for any reason. Uh, they only was only intended to be for Good Samaritans. So if you're acting in a Good Samaritan way, fine. But if you're not acting in a Good Samaritan way, you have no, you should not have this blanket uh, liability. And we, when we talk about liability from what? I talked about financial defamation. Um, there's a variety of things that Professor Citron and Mr. Wittes, you know, talk about. And it, and it basically the court, the, it, it, she, she argues that, you know, revenge pornographers, you know, college gossip sites shouldn't have this type of immunity. There's also the, you know, legislation that's going through Congress right now on um, human trafficking uh, should not have this type of immunity. But in the case law, and I can, again, ask, you know, um, Professor uh, Goldman and Professor Cohen to talk about it, you know, we have, people have asked for exceptions to 230 in the, in the courts, state legislatures, and even up here, you know, for everything from, like, housing ads to uh, collectibles and forged autographs, concert tickets, bullying, housing listings, um, threats, harassment, extremist content, um, and, and so on. And on the, la the last one, um, extremist content. We just did a, a panel up here about a month ago. I don't know if you came to it, but it was the question of how do you combat online extremism and people online that, you know, for, from a terrorist perspective, how do you, you know, they're trying to foment um, that kind of lone wolf actor and kind of radicalize people through their postings on the internet. It's a really tricky problem. 
it is very difficult. And we had a panel on this, and I can I'll, I'll link to the video after this. But but you have a huge issue that a lot of that speech um, is is protected speech, um, even though we do think that it leads to perhaps radicalization. How do you deal with that? The the government, the the United States government, is in really a tricky position because it's hard for them to. Um, restrict the speech from a First Amendment perspective, it's really super challenging. So a lot of actors are working on that problem. And that, I'd throw that into this basket of Section 230, um, where ISPs don't want that content on, on the Internet, but are having trouble figuring out what is actually inciting to violence or what is actually just, you know, an imam talking about um, Islam. So um, that, I think, uh, Professor Cohen can talk more about that. But let me just ask you, Rachel, first of all, Section 230 was passed, done by Congress. Um, I don't think Congress gets credit for it. Um, and I certainly, they don't, certainly don't stand up and t take credit for it all the time. But l from the perspective of the industry and from companies and, and the emerging marketplace of the Internet, what has Section 230 done um, for the Internet? Yeah, so I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so first of all, uh, Engine is a nonprofit advocacy organization that represents the voice of startups in D.C. Um, we have a, a diverse group of startups that we work with um, who don't always have the resources to engage on the Hill, and most of them are spending their time finding their next round of capital, hiring engineers, um, making sure they're entering the right markets, and and innovating really new and creative solutions um, and business models. Um, and so I think uh, when we're looking at, I want to first address um, your notion that uh, the internet is all grown up. Um, I think that if anybody opens up their phone, you'll see that you have dozens of apps that were not around uh, even two years ago um, that are all protected by uh, 230. Um, whether you're looking at uh, dating apps or Venmo, um, there are tons of things that we all use in our everyday life that uh, we're communicating with others, we're making our speech uh, heard, and also just facilitating business transactions. Um, and CDA 230 is able to protect that. And it's really important for startups who are finding new and innovative ways to be able to test out these new platforms without having to fear um, a lot because they're already, they're, they're already concerned with a lot of different challenges that a startup faces. Um, throwing a liability for all sorts of things, whether you're talking about uh, defamation or harassment um, or bad actors who uh, are using uh, platforms that are you know, not designed uh, for bad actors. They're designed for all of us here in this room. Um, Section 230 provides that assurance that they can move forward and continue to grow their business. And if something bad is happening, they're able to reevaluate and tweak and take that content down or um, reassess their business strategy going forward. Um, so we're able to grow and have new and innovative platforms because of a lot of the protections that CDA 230 provides. And, and uh, Professor Conan, maybe, and then um, Eric, you can follow up. How, how has the Section 230, what's, what's the intersection between um, Section 230 and kind of freedom of expression? Um, if you guys can maybe explain how Section 230 enables that um, and maybe constricts that. Uh, yeah, so uh, when we think about free speech, we normally think about the First Amendment, that it was enshrined in our Constitution that we have this right to free speech, and there's also a separate reference to free press. Um, and that sets a, a constitutional floor on the amount of speech that we can have in our society or the types of speech that we can have in our society. But legislatures are free to adopt laws that do more to promote speech. And so Section 230 is what I call a speech-enhancing statute. It says we know that there's, the First Amendment provides a minimum level of protection, but we choose to go further to advance our free speech goals. And in particular, what it does is it enables services to think about different ways of engaging with publishing third-party content. So in the traditional historical models, you had a very tight editorial process where the publisher had to review and feel comfortable with what they were uh, disseminating from third parties because they were taking 100% liability for that. 
Uh, with Section 230, by changing the liability paradigm, it enables a wider range of editorial practices that not only enables more speech, but it enables new speech that might never have occurred under a different liability regime. So, um, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, yes, I agree with that, um, but up to a point, right, which you were expecting me to say, right? So, so. On the one hand, 230 has been speech enhancing. On the other hand, it has also been sort of strategically used as a get out of jail free pass for a lot of stuff that um, is argued to be speech because it consists of processing information, right? And of course, on the internet, everything is information. But there are these cases that don't really fit the paradigm, so the roommates com case, which I know you hate, um, uh, and the AccuSearch case about telephone pretexting, which I also know you hate, um, were um, housing discrimination and consumer protection cases that got swept up into the sort of ever-expanding orbit of 230 because they're information processing and online. Um, and, and I do think that um, what we're sort of running into at this point is kind of the law of unintended consequences, right? Um, it's a, it, it's, and, and, and I want to, I want to put one additional issue kind of on our plate in that regard. So when CDA 230 was proposed, and even today in the way it's talked about, there is this romantic notion of, um, of content provision, right? The, the internet consists of people providing the pipes, right, and people providing the content. And you can see those assumptions in the legislative history, and you can even see them in some of the things that have been said here. Um, what was not on anybody's radar screen and what has not been said here yet is intermediation, right? Um, in addition to serving content, um, the internet is an internet of platforms, and platforms use algorithms to intermediate what content is targeted to what viewers. So while I totally get that you may not have ever seen any sexually explicit content on Facebook, that's because they know you don't want to see it. I wasn't right? looking and, really hard, by the way. Right. I and, you know, and without saying anything about your you know, predilections one way or the other, <laughs> um, there's this sort of third sense of what goes on, uh, you know, on the internet and, 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 and more specifically in the platform space that's not conduit, it's not content. In order to get those apps into the app store, you go through a platform in the first place. And it just was not contemplated at the time that 230 was proposed and enacted that this would be working this way. Um, and it really complicates how we need to talk about these kinds of content. I think. So uh, are you suggesting um, that at the time that the Section 230 was created, which again was the time of the Macarena, um, it, was a, it was an idea that there would just be a series of tubes or a series of pipes and then be content going through it. It would be really difficult to see that. But the way, you're arguing the way the architecture is kind of uh, drawn out is that you have a series of platforms um, at, at different levels of the stack, whether the major platform being the root way down here, all the way all the way to like registrars and app stores and things like that. And so we have a different architecture than we originally had. Is that what you're say saying? Yes, um, but also that that bears on the statute in a way that actually almost comes close to making the statute incoherent. So there's a provision in the statute to sanction um, voluntary blocking and screening of offensive material, um, but algorithmic intermediation of access to material is a whole nother situation um, because it's a question of making sure, you know, you don't get it, but the person who has the interest in maybe, you know, seeing a little of the terrorist content does get it. The person who's looking for the, for the videos of the arguably underage or teenage girls gets that. Um, and it's also completely automated and done by machine learning, so it's hard to point to an actor with knowledge at any given point, but it's happening, right? And it just was not, that's not the way the statute is drafted. Um, just, just, can we go back to the project case for a moment, though? Because I think this is a helpful illustration of where we are and, in fact, why I think we're exactly where Congress had hoped we would be. Um, if you recall, the situation in Prodigy is that Prodigy was trying to create a family-friendly service. That was their basic premise. And in order to do that, they were likely to miss stuff. 
They were going to try, but they were never going to be perfect. And so uh, if we had the traditional liability regimes, there was going to be two dominant outcomes in how people would handle the redissemination of third-party content. There would be the full-bore editorial control with pre-screening and vetting, or there would be something that said, I'm going to set up these dumb pipes, and I'm not going to think about them anywhere further. Prodigy was expressly trying to be somewhere in between that. They weren't trying to set up a full-bore editorial control process. They weren't trying to be dumb pipes. They were trying to do more editorial control to try to create the environment that they thought would best serve their customers. And so in some ways, I think that's exactly where we've gotten to, and that that's a good outcome, that we want those uh, those intermediate steps between all editorial control and dumb pipes that we actually get a better outcome because of the fact that people are trying to create and curate these environments. That's why Tim doesn't get the things that he doesn't want on Facebook. That is, I think, a net win for us. Did you want to, before we keep bashing at each other? (laughs) Yeah, I would just, I wanted to, I think you raise a really good point about um, algorithms and and the type of machine learning. Um, But I think, you know, the law has been in place for 21 years, and the type of algorithms and machine learning is just a few years old, really, and we're still growing and advancing. And so I would fear that creating exceptions and, and saying, oh, the computers can do it, um, particularly for startups, that's not really uh, a possibility. We don't, you're a small company, you're not going to be able to purchase uh a tremendous amount of filtering or algorithmic technology that would um, screen and filter out um, a, a lot of the bad content that that is not easily. I mean, the the bad content that we're talking about generally requires uh, more of a human component to it, um, and so having Section Two Hundred and Thirty there to provide that backstop for people who are getting their businesses off the ground and creating new algorithms and better technology is really important to ensure that we're getting to the next phase of the Internet, um, which we're all seeing uh, every single day, new, different developments. So, And that's right, too. right? Um, and note, I haven't actually said... I think we should put X exception into Section 230. The only thing I've said so far is I think the whole thing, the premise of the way the entire section has, is structured has been undermined by unanticipated ways that the technology has developed. Okay, so you basically raise the question, okay, but even so, isn't it the case that anything we try to do would make the situation worse? especially for startups. Um, and there's reason to think that that's right, but there's also reason to think it's wrong. Okay, um, The reason to think it's right is that we seem unable to find yet the new paradigms, right? So this, these bills that the reason we're here is, I assume, because of these bills. What did they do? The... Um, the House bill that has has two exceptions, I guess, in the Senate just has one. But they're using concepts like knowing conduct and reckless conduct. Um, those are really old school concepts that come to us from you know the English common law, and they fit certain kinds of things. I happen to think they fit Backpage, right? Um, I think, you so, know... Forgive me for interrupting. You're talking about the, the Senate bill and the House bill that would go after human sex trafficking and, yeah. and get at ISPs that might yeah. host that stuff. I think there's no question those people knew. Um, and I don't see any reason to give them a get-out-of-jail-free card. Just none. And, and I think Citron and Wittes are right that it won't break the Internet to do that. Um, and if you want to talk about that, we can talk about that. But I'm trying to make a different point, which is we're playing in this little sandbox using these old English co- legal concepts of knowing and reckless conduct that don't in any way describe what an algorithm is doing when it targets content and what the digital advertising piece of that is doing when it targets content. We don't actually have that grammar yet. We don't actually know how to do that yet. You're all looking at me like, great, right? So what are we supposed to do about it? But it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's kind of the regulatory project of, I think, the next half century uh. to figure out what that would be because 
the things in this bill, which clearly are designed in sort of the time-tested way that Congress has to respond to the scandal du jour, right, yeah, may right. respond to it, but don't at all speak to what I'm talking about. Um, and, and, and so you raise a legitimate concern. Um, I still think there's reason to be optimistic about coming to that new grammar about how to talk about algorithms and targeting. Yeah. Um, and 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 I th and I find I have to say I find the oh you know woe is us we'll all be liable for sex trafficking argument a little bit disingenuous because I think it's it's reasonably obvious um, you know which sites are engaging in that behavior yeah. and which aren't so I would be very surprised if you know most if your membership at all had that problem. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so we, you, you were talking about as far as what what knowledge standard does do robots and algorithms have right? So you call, call it the robot. Mens Rea project, yeah. right? What's the knowledge? What, is, what knowledge? I mean, that's an oxymoron. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. like it. Is it? Um, we can talk about that. We can talk about AI and robots some other time. Um, I guess uh, the other question is, um, I think you know, we you mentioned that this is um, you, you mentioned the the SESTA bill in the Senate, the human trafficking, um, and it doesn't probably affect any of any Rachel's members, but um, it is the issue du jour. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's hard to talk about this this particular issue that's hot right now, and then next, tomorrow it's gonna to be this, and that, um, things like that. So, but we can, we can talk more specifically about um, that particular bill if we have questions from the audience, and I'm happy to, to broach that. But let me just, um, let me just, let me just um, ask one, uh, be a little bit of um, the advocate for Professor Citron here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, she, said, she argues with Ben Wittes that when the statute was created um, and how it was interpreted by, in the courts um, really way expanded the scope of what the, the legislation was. It was essentially to protect good Samaritans um, and not necessarily just give limited liability for, for anybody at all. Uh, do you, how, what would you respond to that? Uh, so Section 230 has two primary operative provisions. There's Section 230C1 and Section 230C2. Section 230C1 says, to summarize quite briefly, online services aren't liable for third-party content. And Section 230C2 says, to summarize quite briefly, uh, online services aren't liable for their filtering decisions. And so uh, the fact that there are two operative provisions in the statute actually is a pretty good clue that there were two different problems that they were trying to solve, that they were concerned about the idea that if someone tried to filter out content and they missed something, they wouldn't be liable for that. But they were separately and independently trying to say that if it is third-party content, that's not going to be the responsibility of the editor, uh, the, the, the publisher of that third-party content, to um, uh, make the... Uh, um, uh, to, to undertake that liability. So I, I think that in the context of the battles over children's access to sexual content online, there was a lot of concern about how there would be self-policing or self-regulatory mechanisms. And so that definitely, you can't ignore that backdrop when you think about the bill. But the way the bill was drafted, I think, makes it entirely clear there were two separate concerns, and Congress addressed them in parallel with each other. Do you agree with that? I do, but I think that we are talking now about... Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I forgot oh. to turn on my mic. Um, I agree with that, um, and I think that neither of those sections quite describes where we are now. Right, we've gone again from, um, uh, you know, from blocking and screening, thou shalt not access offensive material because we have a decision, we prodigy or we Facebook about what we want people to see, we've gone from that to targeting. Let's help, you know, white supremacist nationalists find each other better. And I don't think that was anybody's intent, okay? I think it's the law of unintended consequences, but you build the machine to help people find each other better. And, and the and the digital advertising piece that creates economic incentives and rewards to do that, and this is what you get, right? That's how it works. It was not anybody's intent. That's not blocking and screening. It's a horse of a different color. Yeah. Let me, let me ask Rachel, before I get to that, there's a question up here, and I'm gonna go to questions to the audience. I get, um, uh, Rachel, uh, as far as like, you know, Julie's point about um, algorithmic um, filtering and having the ability to to automatically uh, uh, strip out this content and, and, and hear it. 
from the startup's perspective, Engine represents startups essentially, how many, do, do they have the, the ability to create these artificial intelligent algorithms um, as kind of part of their business? Um, and how many employees do these people have? Like how, how easy is this stuff to do? Yeah, I, um, I have two examples. Uh, I wanted to just respond to Julie really quickly in that, you know, it does, the algorithms might make it easier for white supremacists to find each other, but it also makes your life easier when you want to find a restaurant that you really like. Um, so, you know, there are bad actors out there, um, and there are always going to be bad actors, but I think on the whole, the internet has generally improved all of our lives and efficiency. Um, two uh, startup examples I wanted to talk about one quickly that you haven't heard of and one that you definitely have. Um, one startup that I work with a lot is uh, from my hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan. They're called Varsity News Network. Um, they have 30 employees. They host a platform for high school athletic directors to essentially uh, purchase Varsity News Network service, and then they host blogs, and Varsity News Network runs ads along the side, and that revenue goes to high school athletic programs, um, which is a great win-win for both students who are getting uh, journalism and blogging experience and the school who is now um, getting uh, ad revenue. Um, they have 30 employees. They are in 300,000 high schools nationwide. Um, for them to have to monitor, and you're allowing high schoolers to post. So, you know, there's already a lot of potential liability. Um, and a lot of the content that we're talking about, again, um, is not necessarily... Uh, you wouldn't necessarily know it when you see it. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work on sex trafficking recently, and you would be surprised the euphemisms that are used to uh, sell minors online. And we were just talking about the emojis people now use. Um, it's hard for people like us in this room, who I'm assuming are not generally spending full-time uh, trafficking humans, to know exactly what people are talking about when they mention cherries and umbrellas and all sorts of terrible induendos. Um, the, uh, so you've got 30 employees. I don't, I don't see how uh, uh, they could possibly physically monitor all of that. Um, and to continue to get investment, they're going to have to continue to scale um, and grow their business. And so most of their employees are not necessarily um, in the, they do have some employees that do monitor, but that is not necessarily their full-time job. Uh, the other uh, startup that I love to talk about, because um, my coworker makes me use it, is Bumble. Um, Bumble is just a two-year-old company. They have 12.5 million users. Um, the average user on Bumble spends 100 minutes a day on Bumble. Um, Bumble has 60 employees. They could not possibly uh, be able to monitor all of the communications that go on in Bumble. And I can tell you there are a lot of creepy dudes on Bumble, um, creepy women too, I'm sure. Um, but uh, it, is, it would not be easy, it would not be an easy task for 60 employees to be looking at all of the speech that occurs on their app. And most of the speech that's happening on Bumble is happening on their app, um, even though you could exchange phone numbers. Occasionally people do that, I'm told. Um, so this is just my two kind of examples of startups who are growing quickly, who have large scale, who are very successful, but do not have um, filtering. They might have some filtering technology available to them, but the way filtering technology works is very hard to catch things like sex trafficking. But well, thank you for that. And um, let me just go to, I have a question here in the front row. We have Carl Zabo in the back with a, a question and then um, one right here as well. Um, sir? So can, if you can repeat the question as you understand it. So we can hear it on Facebook. Uh, tell me if I got it correctly. Uh, when we're trying to assess the complicity of an online service for third-party content or actions, should we leave that to the service provider to decide, or is that something that Congress should dictate? And you also yeah. mentioned the self-regulatory body. Uh, did you have an example of what that might be?
interest. Okay, so the DAA and the NII are advertising network trade associations, um, but you could also talk about the Global Network Initiative or, or other type of NGOs that create kind of guidelines and things like that. Uh, yeah, so a couple of thoughts. Um, let's go back to Section 230, uh, C1. It says that websites or online services aren't liable for third-party content. Um, there are three exceptions to that statute. Uh, first, there's a, an exception for intellectual property claims. And Congress, of course, has enacted intellectual property claims that are governed by that exception. Uh, second is that there's an exception for um, uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which is the wiretapping statute, and state law equivalents. Again, Congress has provided some guidance on that. Um, then the third exception, and the one that's relevant to things like the discussions about sex trafficking, is that there's an exception for federal criminal law uh, prosecutions. And that exception covers all federal crimes, uh, that any prosecution under those federal crimes is already excluded from this general statement that online services aren't liable for third-party content. So to my, from my standpoint, I think that We've answered that question in large part. Congress already defines the, the standards and conduct of online services by the parameters it's set through federal criminal law. We have a whole body of law that is in, incorporated in toto into the, the, the behavior of the online services that otherwise enjoy this Section 230C1 immunity. Beyond that, I'll just throw out a general observation. I apologize for being so general about it, which is that uh, for Congress to dictate uh, 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 standards of editorial practices about how sites should handle editorial content, um, is it's troublesome. There's first a First Amendment overlay, but more likely, as we see new technology develop, as we're seeing different ways for a technology to improve and uh, uh, enhance the way that we talk to each other, it's very hard to, for Congress to anticipate where that's going and to custom craft a proper standard for that. Um, I apologize for being so general at that level. We could talk more specifics in specific categories. And I, I welcome uh, a comment from Professor Cohn. Uh, you mentioned two privacy advertising, advertising uh, uh, trade, trade associations that do self-regulation, which Professor Cohn knows a lot about. <laughs> um, is this an area where maybe self-regulatory associations and agencies could fill the void? So, <clears throat> all right. And I don't mean to go, I don't want to go down <laughs> no, a privacy I, rat I hole. I have an answer, um, <laughs> and I'm just trying to not have it get too long. Um, so, so... Here it is. Um, it will strike you as a little crazy, no doubt. Um, there's Congress. There's the self-regulatory bodies. And there are the agencies, right? You didn't actually mention the agencies. You were out at the ends. Um, it's important to talk about the agencies. And if we talk about the agencies, um, it would be useful to consider that the agencies we have were all sort of created in the first part of the 20th century according to the needs of an industrial economy. And part of what the problem is here, I think, at a pretty high up abstract level, is we have these online entities whose activities are spilling over potentially into the FCC, the FTC, the antitrust division of DOJ, um, the FDA, right, a million other places, the NTIA, um, and in my perfect world, we need an administrative state that is optimized for the information economy that we are starting to have. Um, so with regard to your question, that handicaps me a bit and that I can't point my finger and go, oh, it's that agency or, oh, it's that agency. I think the dysfunction is a little more fundamental. Um, and I'm sorry to, to be constantly kind of dragging the discussion up to this higher level, but I honestly think that's, a, that's where we need to be at this point because the, the structure of the regulatory state that we have is actually hampering the ability to have a coherent response to this, right? So Eric, you're talking about federal criminal law and federal criminal prosecution, and yes, we always have that. Um, but if you come back to this question I'm trying to tee up of what do we do about the law of unintended consequences, right? What do we do about this, um, about intermediation and targeting as opposed to blocking and tracking? Um, it all needs to be invented, I think, from the ground up, including the institutional structure. Unfortunately, the folks who would need to, do, well, I don't want to insult anybody, right? I was so unfortunate. It's okay. The, fo it's the folks who would need to do that are Congress, 
right? And that's such a big project, and as you all know very, very well, there are a number of other very big projects that Congress has in front of it and other issues that one might raise about Congress. Um, but, but you don't get that redesign without Congress. Um, and if you could identify yourself and who you're with and before your question. Uh, right. So um, let's start with the first question. Um, the, as I mentioned, federal criminal prosecutions are categorically excluded from Section 230. So um, there's no restriction in Section 230 on the DOJ's decision to prosecute. Um, so uh, they have uh, a, a specifically tailored law that was targeting Backpage called the SAVE Act that was passed in 2015 by Congress that was designed to uh, regulate uh, online prostitution advertising, the, the publication of online prostitution advertising. They also then have a wide range of other federal crimes that uh, they could use. And um, I'm not an expert in all the different uh, areas of crimes, but um, if you look at some of the other analogous things, there's things like money laundering that would be an example of something or the wire fraud that would be associated with it. Those are the kinds of crimes that would typically pick up some behavior like this, uh, the, the issue in Backpage. Um, so whether or not Backpage has violated federal crime is something I don't have a personal view about because I don't have all the facts. Um, but the DOJ has the ability to get all the facts, and in fact, they are conducting a grand jury investigation today in Phoenix of Backpage. And so um, I'm optimistic that they are doing the steps necessary to gather the information and to, um, uh, to reach the appropriate conclusion. Um, I, if I can just t quickly turn to the second question. The second question is, how would the Internet look like without a Section 230 and if the prodigy decision remained the law of the land? Now, it was only a state court decision in New York, and so it wasn't necessarily the only answer that courts might have given. Um, but we can't really answer the A-B test results of, you know, we have Section 230 and non-Section 230 in the U.S., what would it look like? But we can look at other countries and see what they are doing. And as we know, we have by far the most robust environment for the development of uh, services that help uh, uh, publish third-party content. Um, they are not being developed in other countries. If you look at the major internet companies in other countries, they're often very traditional types of publication platforms. Think about something like Spotify, for example, from, uh, help me out, Sweden, Norway, um, uh, uh, which, you know, it is a publisher of third-party content, but they go through all the old-school rules, and they've had to pay the substantial price in order to do that. And that, of course, becomes a very ossify ossifying uh, environment for which to develop. Um, so where is the YouTube of Europe? Um, where is the Twitter of Brazil? Um, they're here. Um, and um, by the way, you mentioned the SAVE Act, which was uh, sponsored by Chairman Bob Goodlad, who's the chairman of the Congressional Inner Caucus. Just a little shout out, so I hope you don't mind. Uh, Ma'am? Oh, uh, in the back? Yeah. If you could identify yourself and... Uh, 
Uh, if I can, I, I will uh, take uh, the advantage. Um, I'm not aware of any prosecutions of the SAVE Act. Backpage did a preemptive challenge of the SAVE Act, and the court rejected the challenge on procedural grounds. And along the way, it said something pretty interesting. It said that the uh, publication of online prostitution advertising was categorically outside the First Amendment. And so as a result, it actually... Uh, while there is the knowing standard that's in the bill, it also creates this possibility that there may be more freedom to maneuver than you might have feared with the First Amendment challenge. How that all gets sorted out is, is way above my ability to, to speculate. Um, but we, I expect we'll get a lot of insights into that question once we hear more from what happens in the grand jury investigation in uh, in Phoenix. Um, I cannot tell you if the SAVE Act is part of that investigation. I can only speculate. You know, I'm uh, sorry, grand jury investigations are secret, so we don't know. It's a black box to all of us. Um, it would be surprising to me if the SAVE Act was not part of that investigation. Any other questions? Sir? Uh, the question is, uh, the DOJ uh, may be under-resourced. What role uh, for the state prosecutors? Um, and uh, Section 230 does uh, uh, preempt state criminal prosecution. So uh, it, is, uh, it only excludes federal criminal prosecutions. That does then restrict the ability of someone like the state AG to enforce the SAVE Act or even a state law equivalent of it. However... The states are still free to prosecute any first-party behavior by any of the operations. So, for example, in the back page prosecution that is taking place in California, the state uh, was able to survive a motion to dismiss on money laundering charges against Backpage. Now, uh, that's, I think, a good example that if, in fact, Backpage or any other criminal enterprise has violated state crimes, there is a wide range of potential tools that could be deployed in that circumstance. I'm sorry, I keep dominating. Keep. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, Section 230 has some funky language there that says that state laws are not uh, inconsistent with this section or not preempted. But the way that it has been interpreted is that uh, section, they have to be consistent with Section 230. Ma'am? And if you could kind of re-articulate the question, and she's talking about um, in the aftermath of Charlottesville, um, the Daily Stormer site was taken offline by GoDaddy, which is a registrar that, that assigns the domain name, so which points to where the co what server the content is hosted on. So there are all different levels of the stack, and GoDaddy is just one of them. Uh, right, and I was quoted in the press as saying that we, it was relatively unusual to see a domain name registrar turning on or off a domain name as a solution to content that was problematic at the particular domain name. Um, and the reason why is because the domain name registrars, um, all they do is make a match in the database between the domain name and a set of IP addresses identified by the domain name registrant. So when uh, their only remedy is to break that linkage and to basically turn off the domain name and make it not resolvable. 
Um, they can't excise any individual item of content, and they can't uh, excise any subcategories that the website is operating. They can only turn off the website in total. So we get a little nervous when we see that that uh, remedy exercise because it's such a blunt instrument. Let me let me make it clear, however, that Section 230 protect that decision by GoDaddy. It enabled them to make that choice. And so without that Section 230's protection, it is probable that GoDaddy, even if it objected to the uh, to, to Nazi content on its service, would have been paralyzed from actually being able to take any action. So just two quick points about that. Number one, we take domains away from people all the time when we think they infringe trademarks. And number two, they could have used their terms of service to get to the same result. So I don't think either of those points is right. Okay. Well, um, I guess in, in we have like uh, 120 seconds left. So let me let me kind of wrap up and let let the folks um, kind of part with some closing comments, um, if, if it were. And, and but let me just say that the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee was created um, 21 years ago to be a really a neutral forum to debate and discuss really important internet issues that Congress needed to better understand. Um, we have this kind of rule of journalistic neutrality. We try not to stack the deck in one way or the other. Um, I would say I have to be on the record is when it comes to Section 230, um, the, the organization was created in the aftermath of that. And frankly, as an, as an institution, we're kind of on record as being very in much in favor of Section 230. So I just wanted to be very clear about that. We actually hosted a, a, an anniversary event um, in the 15th anniversary like six years ago, and we titled it Section 230, the legislation that saved the Internet. So we're kind of on record as being very, very, but it was created, the statute was created before my organization was created. So um, I, just, just so they know, but generally all of our events are really where I'm totally neutral on, on net neutrality, on copyright issues, on patent litigation. Uh, this is probably one of those exceptions. So forgive me, um, but the statute predates the organization. So in parting, um, what would you say to folks up here trying to figure out um, what the, the question on the table is, how many exceptions should we have for Section 230, and is, is Congress approaching it in, in the right way? Um, I don't see a problem with especially the knowing conduct exception. I'm, I'm more on the fence on the reckless disregard one. I just don't think the, the paradigm works anymore. Um, so I, I would rather see some higher level thinking about how to start over. Um, it doesn't mean I think it should go away, right? Um, I just think there needs to be some higher level thinking about um, what the purposes are and what the limits are. Um, so I guess I have two kind of closing thoughts. Uh, first would be, um, you know, there's definitely a disconnect between uh, tech and Congress, but there's also a di disconnect between Congress and tech. And I think that it's great that we're doing panels like this and that, um, you know, we're up here talking to you all because um, we want to hear from you as much as you probably don't want to hear from us. Um, but I also, my other point would be um, for Congress to, I think there's sometimes a sentiment that tech should just nerd harder, that if you could just go away and figure this out on your own, you put a man on the moon, why can't you figure out how to get sex predators off the internet? Um, or whatever the problem of the day is, whether that's encryption or other things. Um, you know, we're still... Uh, not a pretty new and, and young industry, and we're trying to figure it out. And I think that having uh, an open and honest dialogue about what tax capabilities are and what Congress's capabilities are would be um, a welcome conversation on both ends. And so I'm really glad that we're doing this panel, and I hope that um, if any of you ever have any tech questions, you know, I always want to be a resource for uh, congressional staffers. Um, as we know, uh, sometimes uh, some of our constituents are a little uh, disgruntled towards Congress. Uh, approval ratings aren't always the highest. Um, and so I would point to Section 230 is actually 
one of the times when Congress can stand up and say, look at what we did, and we are proud of it, that we actually realized that there was an opportunity to make uh, uh, something great and that we proactively tried to advance that goal. And now with 21 years of data, we could say, what a remarkable success story that has become. So from my perspective, Section 230 is easily Congress's one of, one of Congress's most successful internet uh, uh, free speech moves ever, um, and it could be one of Congress's greatest free speech achievements of all time. And so I would just caution if uh, anyone thinks that it's going to be easy to tinker with Section 230 and still uh, uh, see uh, the, the success stories that we've had, we need to really make sure that we're not messing with the things that have helped make the Section 230 great and make the Internet great, and I personally would say help make our country great. So with that, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank the panelists for coming um, from near and far. And, and thanks so much. We'll see you soon.